Good morning. Good morning. Everybody was just starting to get loud and getting uh, talking to everybody. I hate to shut that down, but welcome this morning. Um, for announcements, um, remember the men's and women's conferences coming up. And if you haven't paid for them, those get paid to Emily and make the check out to St. Ansgar Baptist. Is that correct? Okay. Um, next Sunday is small groups starting back up, so Denny's and at Bob's starting up next week again. Also, uh, there's a change in speakers today, which I didn't need to announce because you'd figure it out. Um, Marv got uh, not feeling the best, so uh, we switched that up a little bit, and we'll have Josiah be speaking today. And. Also remember the quarterly business meeting is on August 6th. So keep that on your calendar. We moved it back a month. And I, yeah, they didn't change it. Uh, next uh, September, so a month, <clears throat> anyhow. August 16th. Okay, all right. Well, uh, start our songs. <clears throat> Thank you for that smooth transition. Appreciate that. <laughs> if you'll stand with me, we will begin singing. Um, sorry, can I get it? Um, Love Was Win. We'll stand and sing. Um, this is a song that is new to me. It might be new to some of you. But I think the newness hopefully will help us look at the words and think about the words. Um, and it... We get a picture of what true love looks like. True love is not just, you know, happy, warm feelings. There was action behind it, and God actually sent um, his son to pay for our sins. I really like the first line where he talks about God became a man locked in time and space without rank or place. So, again, very, very vivid language of the God of the universe having to be in a body and being a servant, being a nobody for us. And so as we go through and sing this song, hopefully it will um, help us as we learn it to see the words and to really think about them. Not too bad first verse. It's, there's a little bit of a, some like you know, hold some stuff and some stuff goes a little faster, but I think we'll get the hang of it on the second verse and maybe we'll have to sing this some other time to really get it down. Love was when God became a man down where I could see love that reached to me. Love was God. trapped was I, my whole world came in. Love was when Jesus rose to walk with me. Love 
lovingly on new, new life that's free. Love was God, only He would try to re reach and love one such as I. Good job, everyone. Um, if you'll take a seat and pay attention to these verses on the screen and think about them as we prepare our hearts for worship. Thank you for that. Hopefully we took some time to think about those verses, and I hope that you can also say that you are um, saying no to un ungodliness and worldly passions today. And if not, that we would bring our hearts in line with God so that we can worship together. If you'll stand again with me, we will sing Shepherd of Love, another new one that I had to learn this morning. So uh, hopefully we can look at these words and think about them. And again, the idea of Jesus coming to us, Jesus making the first move, finding us where we were, the idea of a shepherd going for that one lost sheep, leaving the 99, going and finding us when we needed him, when we had lost our way. Shepherd of love, you knew I had lost my way. Shepherd of love, you cared that I'd gone astray. You sought and found me, place around me, strong arms that carried me home. No foe can hold Not too bad. First, first verse. Was that new to anyone? Okay. So we'll have a second verse. It's kind of, it's a nice kind of just go along with the flow of the music. It, I think we'll catch on pretty quick. Shepherd of love, contentment at last is mine. Deep in my heart, there's peace and the joy. Future's brighter, burdens lighter, my cup runs over each day. Your grace applied me now, provides me all that I need for the way. Shepherd of love, Savior and Lord and guide, Shepherd. Amen. You might be you may be seated. The gentleman will come forth and we'll receive the offering.
Let's pray. Dear God, we are so thankful for this morning. We are thankful that we can sing these truths, that you are the shepherd of love. You are the one who comes and finds us. You will buy us back out of sin. You will rescue us from the miry pit. You will redeem us unto yourself. And we are thankful for that this morning. And because of that redemption, because of that saving uh, that we have, we can now be in your family and we can gather together with your family on this day and in this place. We thank you for those things that you have provided for us, a place to worship together, a, a group of believers to fellowship with. And so we ask that you would help us to give in response to that. We know that you desire to have a cheerful giver, giving out of hearts of gratitude for what you've done. So I ask that you would bless these offerings that we give, that you would use them to further your work. And we love you, God. Thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that offertory a medley of different songs talking about Calvary. We had at Calvary. We had burdens are lifted at Calvary. And the middle one was um, Calvary covers it all. Um, I will have our scripture reading now. It's not what's on the screen, but that's okay. If you will turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. If you have a chair Bible there, it's page 1014. 1014, we will be reading 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14, all the way down through chapter 2, verses 3. The Apostle Peter writes, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conducts, conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you are ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, 
but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth by a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that, you, that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now if you will stand with me, we will continue singing. We will sing complete in thee. Again, having everything we need in Christ, having all of our needs met spiritually, physically, we are enough because we have Christ. Complete in thee, no work of mine may take, dear Lord, the place of thine. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and I am now complete in thee. Yea, justified, a blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Complete in thee, no more self sin, thy grace hath conquered reign within. Thy voice shall bid the tempter flee, and I shall stand complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh blessed thought, and sanctify salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Complete in thee, each one supplied, and no good thing to me denied. Since thou my portion, Lord, will be, I ask no more complete in thee. Yea, justified, O blessed thought, and sanctify salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and glorify I too shall be. Now on the last as we think about the future time when we will be singing with the saints, if you would drop out on the chorus for us, that'd be great. Dear Savior, when before thy bar all tribes and tongues assembled are, among thy chosen will I be at thy right hand complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Amen. Good singing. And then one more song before Brother Josiah comes. His robes for mine. Again, thinking of what Christ did for us that... I was accepted, though I was an outcast, and he was God's son, and yet he was rejected by God. And that amazing contrast that we see in this song, the, the amazing truth of the salvation that we have in Christ. His robes for mine, a wonderful exchange, clothed in my sin. Suffer neath God's rage, draped in his rod. 
righteousness I'm justified. In Christ I live, for in my place he died. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God is strange from God. But by such love my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, what cause have I for dread? God's daunting law, Christ mastered in my stead. Causeless I stand, with righteous works not mine. Saved by my Lord's vicarious death and life. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God is strange from God. But by such love my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, God's justice is appeased. Jesus is crushed, and thus the Father's pleased. Christ drank God's wrath on sin, then cried, "'Tis done." Sin's wage is paid, propitiation won. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God is strange from God. But by such love my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, such anguish none can know. Christ God's beloved, condemned as though his foe. He adds the why, a curse and left alone. I as though he embraced and welcomed home. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God is strange from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. Good singing this morning. You may be seated. Children can be dismissed to Children's Church. Brother Josiah, bring us the word. what he's done for us and that <laughs> sorry my life isn't mine to live anymore <laughs> that it's his okay <clears throat> enough of that um, <laughs> um, we're going to talk about conduct becoming saints and when I say the word becoming that's not a word that we use a lot anymore in that kind of context um, and all that it means is it <laughs> It, you, you might say to someone that's, that's wearing a nice shirt, that shirt becomes you. It looks good on you. Well, what looks good on God's children? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today, is the kind of lives that we should be living that looks good on us in light of what God's done for us. If you do a quick search on Google for the words disorderly conduct, uh, it brings us certain examples because it's, uh, it's criminal terminology. And it might mean fighting in public, public intoxication, screaming obscenities at people on the street, or loudly disrupting a public meeting. There's obviously other things that that would cover. Um, that is conduct that's deemed disorderly by our local or federal governments. 
it definitely gives us a bar of like, okay, definitely avoid these things. That's not good. But what kind of things should we be aiming for? What kind of conduct should we be, should be expected of God's children? And that's what I want to talk about today as we dive back into 1 Peter chapter 1. So if you've got your Bibles with you, open those to 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll be starting in verse 14, verses 14 through 16. First Peter 1, 14 through 16. And that says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now if you think of the passions of your former ignorance, that's the disorderly conduct. <laughs> that's our passions our former ignorance, but then we're called to holiness. And so that's our kind of our, our first point. We have three points today, main points, that are the conduct that is becoming uh, believers. And so our first one is holiness, that we're called to be holy as he is holy. Passions of former ignorance really means the former lusts that were yours in your ignorance. Okay? <clears throat> that's us in the past, before God changed us, before we were saved, before we were made alive spiritually, we were dead. <laughs> you can't be more ignorant than death. We couldn't know. Okay, so we were ignorant in our spiritual death, and he made us alive spiritually, and so now we're not ignorant anymore. And so he's saying, don't be conformed to the way you were. Now that word conform means to fashion alike, to conform to the same pattern, or to fashion oneself according to. That's what am I choosing to line my life up with? Okay, so this is a conscious choice. So he's calling us to consciously choose to be holy as opposed to consciously choosing to live the life that we used to live. Okay, that's the, the contrast. He says, but be holy. Conform yourself to the pattern. Don't conform yourself to the pattern of your former ignorance when you were dead, but conform yourself to a pattern of holiness set by God himself. He commands us, be holy for I am holy. We should not be the same as we've always been. God is changing you. We talked about this in the first half of first, of, uh, of first Peter chapter 1 when we talked about sanctification and that God works in the lives of believers to change them, to make them more and more like him. And that's an ongoing process. It begins at salvation, and it ends at glorification when we're made perfect in heaven. But it's a process in between those two. But it's an ongoing process, a process that shouldn't stop. And the things that would stop that process are grieving the Holy Spirit and quenching the Holy Spirit, which is us choosing to ignore the Spirit's conviction in our life, choosing to walk away from God's word, which is a really serious and really scary thing. So that, that process should be ongoing unless we're choosing to walk away from God. So we shouldn't be the same as we've always been because God's changing us. He's promised to sanctify us and he will do what he sets out to accomplish. We are patterning ourselves after him, right? So he's working in us. We're patterning ourselves after him so if we aren't becoming more like him, or there's no desire to become more like him, we need to take a hard, long look at our lives. Because that's not characteristic of a believer. That's really scary. So if that's you, think about that. And that's not a place to, to stay. You shouldn't look at your life and say, oh no, something's wrong. Oh well, I can't do anything about it. So you need someone to help you. You either need to go to God's word and see who God wants you to be and pursue who God wants you to be. You should do that. And then also seek out someone that's godly, that you know is godly, and ask them, help me. Clearly something's wrong. Help me. And there's lots of those people here. If you're not sure who, talk to pastor. The pastor would love to point you in any of those directions. Okay, so that's holiness. That's our first, our first uh, piece of conduct piece of spiritual clothing that looks good on God's children. That's what we should be pursuing is holiness. Not the way we used to live, which is a really long list, a laundry list of, of sinfulness, but holiness, which is untainted, which is pursuing God single-heartedly. 
So we move on to fear. So holiness and then fear. Fear looks good on God's children. Uh, look at verses 17 through 21. First Peter 1, 17 through 21. It says, And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not like not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Our Father is an impartial jo judge. This judge that he's, Peter's talking about in this passage is not a salvation judgment. He's talking to believers because he says, and if you call on him as father, okay, God is our father if we accept Christ's uh, gift to us of salvation. If you have not accepted Christ's gift of salvation, you cannot call on God as father, okay? So we're talking about believers here. We've already established we're talking about believers because of what Peter said. So this is clearly, this is a judgment between sinful or righteous thoughts, actions, and motives in the heart and life of a believer, okay? Between sinful or righteous thoughts, actions, and motives in the heart and life of a believer. So God, as a father and impartial judge of our thoughts and actions and motives, pours out his spiritual blessing on those who are seeking him and fellowshipping with him and exacts loving discipline on those who have turned from him to serve their flesh and love the world. So this is a worldly believer. And it's not that, well, I did these seven obedient things, so I get these blessings from God. God wants to bless all of his children, and he's there, and he's waiting to bless us. It might not be a Corvette, okay? He doesn't always bless his children financially, but he always blesses his children. It might be in our community, in our church. It might be a spiritual blessing of joy or uh, an ability to edify um, the people around you despite circumstances, he will bless his children. But God can't bless you if you're running from him. You can't have a conversation with someone that has their back turned to you and they're, and they're running away. Okay? So if, you're, if you've repented of your sins and you've confessed your sins and you're seeking God and pursuing God, you receive his blessings. If you don't do that, then you can't because you're turned away from him. You're not in fellowship with him. And that's, what, that's what's happening here. It's not a salvation judgment that he's judging, but a judge of sinfulness and righteousness, our thoughts, actions, and motives. Because as saved individuals, accepting Christ's gift of salvation, our debt's already been paid for. There is, there, the sin is gone as far as the east is from the west. But there's still relationship. And when I sin, I'm turning my back on God. And so then I receive his loving discipline to bring me back to him. So fear, that's, that is, that's a scary thing. I don't want to have my back turned to God. So he says, because you're calling on him as father, conduct yourselves with fear. <clears throat> Some redefine the fear of God for believers as respecting him. And respect is definitely something that's included in the concept of fear and fearing God. But there's so much more to it than that. A biblical fear of God for the believer includes understanding how much God hates sin, fearing his judgment of sin, even in the life of a believer, because consistent, hardened sin leads to his discipline. And that can be a scary thing, even in the life of a believer. So there is a level of fear because of that. While that discipline is done in love, it's still a fearful thing. When we were children, our fear of discipline from our parents no doubt prevented some evil actions on our part. I knew if I talked back to my mom that I was going to get a spanking. I know that's not necessarily kosher these days, but that's the way it was. And I didn't disrespect my mom because I didn't want to get a spanking. And so there's a level of fear that prevents us, can prevent us, or give us motivation to not sin. And the same should be true in our relationship with God. We should fear his discipline and therefore seek to live our lives in a way that pleases him. Believers are not to be scared of God. 
There's no reason to be scared of him. He gives us perfect love, and the Bible says that perfect love casts out fear. There is no fear in perfect love. So we're not to be scared of God. We have no reason to. But we have his promise that nothing can separate us from his love. We have his promise that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Fearing him means having a reverence for him that greatly impacts the way we live. The fear of God is respecting him, obeying him, submitting to his discipline, and worshiping him in awe. Conduct yourselves with fear. But then, as we go on in the verse, he talks about we were ransomed from the feudal ways we inherited from our forefathers. It talks about we weren't ran ransomed with uh, perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, and that Jesus was foreknown from the foundation of the world, made manifest or made to be clear, seen clearly in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. And it's a reminder to us to not forget where we came from. We were ransomed from feudal ways. The feudal ways inherited from our forefathers, what it's talking about is literally the way of life that was handed down to us by our ancestors. And it's what he's pointing to is humanity and its life without Christ. That's what he's talking about when he says the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers is the, the futility, the worthlessness of our way of life without Christ. And he redeemed us from that, from worthlessness, from literally we did not have worth. He didn't just save us from hell. He bought us out of the futility of human, human existence that we'd inherited from our ancestors. He brought us out of an empty, meaningless waste of time because that's all the world can really offer us. Peter's point in all of this is that our choices now, after that transaction, truly matter. The choices that you make every day since you've been saved, they have worth now. They are eternal decisions. It's not just, oh, what should I do today to make me feel good? It's how can I honor God with my life? How can I earn precious crowns for heaven? How can I earn things that are of eternal value and make an eternal difference? Our choices after salvation truly matter. As people of great value to God, holy people, we should be terrified should we squander our days continuing to invest ourselves in worthless things. We should be terrified should we squander our ways continuing to invest ourselves in worthless things. We're not only not to forget where we came from, but also what's been done for us. I'm really excited about at the end of the service we're going to talk about communion which is sole purpose is remembering what's been done for us well what are those things we were ransomed we were bought we belonged to someone a slave master we were bought from that slave master okay we were that's what we were ransomed from by jesus precious blood that's an impossible expense the bible says that no one would give up their life for, for a worthless person or an evil person? Why would they give up their life for them? And most people wouldn't even give up their life for someone that's really, really good. But Jesus chose to give up his life for thousands and millions and billions of people whose existence was worthless without him. And he gave us worth. He chose to do that with his blood, the blood of God that became man, a priceless gift, not a sum of money, not a trade of a really good piece of land that would be good for crops, but Jesus' blood. It wasn't on a whim. It wasn't something that he just up and decided to do. Okay, today I'm going to die for the sins of the world. This was always the plan. God's plan from eternity past, before the world was even created, was that Jesus would die for a humanity that had chosen to, to live in sin, to seek themselves, and to live life without him. He chose to do that. 
He created that plan before the earth even existed to shed his blood for us. But why? Love. And that's our next point, our next thing that, our next article of clothing that looks good on God's people is love. So look at verse 22, verses 22 through 25. It says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of a perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that we have preached to you. So there's three, three kind of main things that we want to get from this passage. It's a little bit confusing. We'll get into some of that. But since we've been purified through obedience, since we have been born again, we've been given life through Christ, love one another. But what does it mean that their souls were purified by their obedience to the truth? Does that mean that the more I obey, that I get extra things that make me able to be more godly, or that obedience somehow makes me righteous in God's sight, or I can earn perfection, I can earn my way to be more like God? No, it doesn't. Peter writes that our obedience to the truth has a purifying effect on our souls. It's not that we make ourselves clean by our obedience, but that God has cleared us, declared us clean from sin through Jesus' blood, his death in our place. Rather, when we obey, we're not sinning. If you're obeying God, if you're walking in the Spirit, you're not sinning. You're not fulfilling the fleshly lusts, or as the passage said er earlier, the passions of our former ignorance, our previous existence without Christ. When we obey, we're not sinning. We are living the pure, holy lives that God intends for his people. When we obey him, we stop being double-minded, torn between our selfishness and fulfilling his love for us. Setting our desires aside, my fleshly desires, allows us to give ourselves over to fully loving each other. Because I'm putting my desires away. I'm choosing, I want to desire whatever God has. And if I'm doing that, that how could I have a quarrel with someone? How could I have a fight with something if I set my desires aside? Because James says, where, do your, where does the quarreling and fighting come from among you? It comes from the deep desires, selfish desires in your heart. And I'm setting those aside. I'm setting aside my desires to fully love each other. We, setting aside our desires so that we can fully give ourselves to loving each other. Not being half-hearted or false, but really loving. So Peter says we should go for it with everything we've got. We should abandon our own evil desires and work hard at loving each other instead. Now the word here is actinos. I don't know how to pronounce Greek. But the cool thing about this word is it means earnestly or deeply or at full stretch in an all-out manner with intense strain. That doesn't sound like something that you kind of do half-hearted. It's like all of my being is consumed in this one thing, and that is sharing God's love. Peter tells us to completely exhaust all of our resources in a single-hearted effort to give love to each other, because this is what really matters. It's the only thing that lasts. And that part where it talks about all flesh is like grass and all glory is like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Everything that's material, all the things in this life, the clothes that we wear, the houses that we own, the cars that we own, the land, the crops, we're really seeing a lot of crops withering and dying this year, right? That's because that is the futility of earth. It's temporary. But there's something that's eternal. That's God's word. That's God's truth remains forever. And that's something we're seeking. So let's go to chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. First Peter 2, 1 through 3. This is our call to action. I love, I love words like therefore and 
so because it's it's like he's saying now because of all that we've just talked about now let's go do something so we've talked about the reason behind all of this because we want to be holy because we want to fear because we want to love so put away all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and all slander that's a pretty tough list that's a really tough list malice deceit hypocrisy envy slander Put all of those away. Don't have any in you. It's gone. Put it away from you. And then verse 2, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk. Now, I had a newborn infant. She's growing up. She's great. But I have never seen some, someone, I was going to say something, someone so desperate for something as Shiloh when she was she was hungry. There was nothing that could stop her. She had to have it. And that's what Peter says our approach to God's word should be. It's like a newborn baby who knows nothing but its desire for the milk. It has to have it to live. Peter's saying, you, you desire God's word this way. Like a newborn infant, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if you have indeed tasted that the Lord is good. Put away all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. Like a newborn infant, infant, long for the pure spiritual milk so that you can grow. And I want to boil this down to three simple steps. One, this is for all of us. This is for me too, okay? This is God's word commanding us. Put away the sin that you're holding on to. Put it away. And that doesn't mean hide it so that you can indulge sometimes. Put it away. Gone. That's one. Put away your sin that you're holding on to. Two, desire the word of God like it's the only thing keeping you alive. Because it is. Okay? He made us alive spiritually for him. To desire him. To desire his word. That's our food. That's our life. Desire the word of God like it's the only thing keeping you alive. And then third, remind yourself of God's goodness and thank him for it. And that's verse three. If you've, indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good, remind yourself of God's goodness and thank him for it. And I want to move into the, the communion table as we're, <laughs> we're reminding ourselves of God's goodness because the communion table, its purpose is remembrance is remembering what has Jesus done for us. And I can't think of a more perfect way to remember his goodness than communion. Um, I'd like to sing his robes for mine again, if we could do that before we do communion. And I think that'd just be a really good transition, a really good, this is what we're remembering. This is what we're holding on to. This is why we want to be holy. This is why we want to live in a fear of God. This is why we love each other, is because of Jesus' sacrifice and what he's given for us. So Isaiah and Bonnie, if you come and lead that song before we do communion. Cause have I for dread 
God's daunting law, Christ mastered in my stead. Faultless I stand with righteous works not mine, saved by my Lord's vicarious death and life. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God is strange from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, God's justice is appeased. Jesus is crushed, and thus the Father is pleased. Christ drank God's wrath, on sin then cried, is done. Jesus paid, propitiation won. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God is strange from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, such anguish none can know. Christ God's beloved, condemned as though his foe. He as though I, a curse and left alone. I as though he, embraced and welcomed home. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God is strange from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. If I could have the guys come forward for communion. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 6 says this, For I deliver to you, this is Paul speaking, I deliver to you as first importance that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of, our, most of whom are still asleep, though some, most, <laughs> most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. This is what we're remembering, that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again. <clears throat> First Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, is often the passage that we use um, when we take the Lord's Supper. It says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that Jesus, on the night which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's what we're going to do together now, is remember together <clears throat> Jesus' death and resurrection.
Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your sacrifice that you've given your son to give of himself, to sacrifice for us, for our sins, to give us life, to give us hope in you, to give us a purpose, to save us from the futility of, of our lives without you. And I thank you that we can remember today, as we, as we take this bread and this cup, what you've done for us. We love you, and thank you for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 24 says, And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance with me. Then he took the cup. He said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink in this, as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you that we've been able to come together and worship you and hear your word. And I pray that we would go this week and we would be changed people that we would seek you, that we would seek your word like a newborn, and that we would be changed into your image. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.